Okay, hello everybody. I think we'll get started. Welcome to the RNA Collaborative Seminar for this day in November. You're hosted today by the Harvard Medical School Initiative for RNA Medicine, and I'm Frank Slack. I'm the director of the initiative. It's a pleasure for me today to introduce two of our uh, speakers, but I do have to say, unfortunately, that um, our second speaker today, Kamela Nusera, has just contacted us to say that he uh, is, has to go to a doctor's appointment. And so um, he's actually not able to make this, uh, this seminar today, but we will reschedule him for later. So we have just one speaker today. Uh, so I'll be introducing Dr. Sunit Agarwal. He is an assistant professor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School. And he's the co-program leader for the Stem Cell Transplant Center for Dana Faber. Boston Children's Hospital and the Blood Disorders Center. Dr. Agarwal received his bachelor's at Brown University and then his MD PhD at Harvard Medical School and uh, in the immunology department with Anaja Rao. Uh, he subsequently went on to be a resident and a clinical fellow at Boston Children's Hospital um, and um, finally a, a, a fellow in pediatric hemoglobin Monk at uh, Dana Farber Cancer Institute. He went. He's also uh, moved through the academic ranks of instructor and then assistant professor at Harvard Medical School. And he's currently uh, has has a clinical appointment at Boston Children's Hospital, Dana Farber Cancer Institute, and the Brigham and Women's Hospital here in the Harvard Medical School system. So it's fantastic to have Dr. Agarwal join us today. He's gonna to tell us about targeting telomerase RNA in degenerative diseases. Welcome, uh, Sunit. Great, thanks so much, Frank, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, great. I'm gonna share the screen and hopefully this works. All right. So thanks very much, Frank, and hopefully you can see the screen then as well. That's good, thanks. Okay, excellent. Uh, could, could people just mute themselves, please? Thank you. So thanks to Frank and uh, Jay and the uh, RNA Collaborative for uh, allowing us to present some of our, our work. So as Frank said, I'm a hematologist and a lot of my involvement in the um, RNA community comes from an interest in a rare disease, which has led us into uh, really, uh, we find very fun and interesting studies in uh, non-coding RNA uh, biogenesis. So it's great to be able to present to this community. Um, so the disease that we are focused on is called dyskeratosis congenita. It's a, it's a rare inherited bone marrow failure syndrome uh, described over 100 years ago. Um, and it basically, uh, it, is, it manifests with uh, skin pigmentation abnormalities, uh, mucosal lesions in the mouth, and loss of the nails as some of the classic manifestations. Um, but these are the outward signs of a systemic degenerative disorder. So this was recognized early on that these patients had lots of um, so premature mort mortality, and it was caused by failure of various systems, and the hematologists were getting most involved because these patients had a high rate, as you can see here, of bone marrow failure. But these patients also develop life-threatening lung disease, liver disease, and essentially any organ system can be, um, can be affected in various uh, patients as well. So it wasn't really known what was um, the cause of this for several, several decades until about uh, 20 years ago, and it turns out that these uh, disorders are unified by uh, abnormalities in telomere biology. So just to get us all on the same page, as you know, telomeres are the hexanucleotide repeats at the ends of chromosomes that exist in hundreds of thousands of copies in human cells. Um, and with every cell division, because of the end replication problem, the telomeres uh, shorten. And so then to protect genomic integrity at a critically short length, the telomeres, the telomere ends uh, signals a DNA damage response and the cell undergoes programmed senescence. So that's a, a way of maintaining uh, genetic integrity uh, physiologically. So telomere length essentially determines a cellular replicative capacity. It underlies the Hayflick limit in non-transformed diploid human cells that's been recognized for a long time. But of course, this is a very simplified version of a very, very complicated machinery uh, that you can see here that involves several proteins that form the sheltering complex that prevent the telomere end from being recognized as a double-stranded break several components that are involved in uh, telomere end replication um, and also trimming. And then also an entire machinery, as you know, telomerase that is required, that is required for basically extending telomere ends to maintain self-renewal capacity 
in cells that require it, such as stem cells and embryonic cells, et cetera, uh, too. And what's pictured here in color are all the, all the factors that are known to be mutated in dyskeratosis congenita now. So for, so for 13 or 14 uh, factors and more broadly defined telomere uh, diseases. So there are, uh, this machinery is essential in, in, in humans and when it's uh, compromised, it results in a genetic disorder. But it turns out that this was just the tip of the iceberg. So the recognition of these uh, lesions in patients with this rare disease, dyskeratosis congenita, and the advent then of clinical telomere length testing, which is shown here. These, these are the age adjusted norms of telomere length in lymphocytes in the regular population. And this is a clinically validated test now. Uh, the genetics plus this test started to reveal that this was basically a spectrum of disorders that can manifest essentially at any stage of, of life uh, with either more syndromic forms of disease early on in infancy and childhood, um, which are the classic syndromes, but then in otherwise appear, uh, normal appearing uh, people in the age of 30, 40, 50 years old with primary manifestations and presentations of blood disease, cancer, liver disease, and then pulmonary fibrosis. And these end up being uh, these adult presentations of the more milder form of disease, which is so true for so many other types of genetic dis disorders, end up outnumbering the, um, the classic rare form probably by one or two logs. So this is actually still a rare set of disorders, but um, less rare than, than we thought before too. So um, these, these same, same genes are mutated in these various forms. And there's interesting uh, issues of anticipation where uh, heterozygous mutation that basically results in disease in, in one generation will result in an earlier uh, manifestation in a subsequent generation because of the inheritance of short telomeres and impaired telomere maintenance mechanism. So despite all of this, unfortunately, there's still no curative therapies. So basically we do bone marrow transplantation for the children with marrow failure, lung transplantation, liver transplantation, but ultimately these are just basically trying to solve problems and the patients go on to have other issues too. And there's a real unmet need then for a systemic therapy to safely restore telomere maintenance in these, uh, in these patients. So in terms of thinking about how one might approach this uh, therapeutically, um, of course, one homes in on the machinery that's required for extending telomeres, uh, telomerase. So telomerase is very interesting here. It's, I showed it earlier. It's a ribonucleoprotein uh, that is composed of what most people are familiar with, which is the reverse transcriptase of telomerase, uh, TERT. And this is um, famous in a lot of ways because it is the gatekeeper of telomerase activity. So a regular human somatic cell does not express TERT and undergoes replication and then uh, senescence by virtue of an inability to maintain telomere length. Uh, but if you ectopically express TERT, or if a cell expresses TERT, then it has some self renewal capacity and is immortal. And it's one of the cocktail of the transforming uh, um, factors from uh, Hahn and Weinberg. Um, unfortunately, this has been uh, difficult to think of how to drug, either for downregulation for um, cancer. It have, you know, in, despite 20 years, there hasn't been an effective small molecule to drug uh, this factor. And, um, separate from that, both from the standpoint of genetic therapy or in terms of inducing TERT, it would seem a little bit uh, concerning from a safety standpoint because you might confer telomerase activity on a cell that never was intended to have uh, that capacity then too. What's really interesting in the background is the non-coding RNA component of telomerase, so TERT. So as you can see here, it forms, it's a scaffold for uh, telomerase. It actually encodes the, the template for reverse transcription. And this and its associated factors, and as many of you, of course, know, uh, and we'll get into a little bit more, these are uh, components of the Descarin ribonucle uh, HACA ribonucleoprotein, and these are present in all cells. And so this, uh, this, the rest of this is present in every cell, except it doesn't do anything uh, until TERT is expressed. But when its levels are reduced, you end up with telomere disease. So several of the mutations, and some of them are bolded here, affect the um, stability of, of the telomerase RNA component, the function of the telomerase RNA component, its capacity to traffic in the cell or to complex with TERT itself, and all of those things result essentially in a, in a disease. So um, the, it's, it's very important that, uh, to understand that, and this is actually evidence from the human genetics, essentially that across an entire graded uh, range, both from common genetics all the way to Mendelian diseases, the, the level of the telomerase RNA component, once TERT is on, is what actually determines uh, telomerase activity level in the cell and then telomere lengthening capacity uh, of the cell too. Uh, and because Frank told me we had a little bit extra time, I wanted to tell you how, a little bit, how I got interested in this uh, way back when. So 
uh, my foray into telomere biology started off by trying to actually model dyskeratosis congenita in iPS cells. And what we recognized um, in the earliest days of iPS cell reprogramming is that somatic cells, of course, have the finite rep replicative capacity and TERT was not expressed. But then when you reprogram the cells into iPS cells, TERT was expressed. It was a hallmark of uh, pluripotency. The cells were telomerase positive. And in, in the normal cells, of course, the telomere length got longer and TERT was expressed. And that was very satisfying. But what we noticed in, patient, in cells from patients with dyskeratosis congenita who should have lesions in this pathway and should undergo some level of exhaustion, that basically we saw an upregulation of TERK also. And this was able to compensate for um, shortened telomeres in, in some of the patient's cells. And uh, we posited at the time that TERK upregulation being a feature of the pluripotent state, and given that it could model could model in this capacity the lengthening of telomeres. This showed again, once again that TERK was indeed uh, limiting, and that strategies to inter increase TERK expression could be therapeutically beneficial in, in uh, DC patients. But that's essentially where we were uh, stuck for quite a while because how do you upregulate uh, non coding RNA? So, digging into the telomerase RNA component, uh, it is a very unique and interesting long non coding RNA. It's, a, as I alluded to, a box HACA. Uh, domain snow RNA, and because it has a TCAB binding uh, uh, motif and it's lo localized in Cajal body, it's a SCA RNA. But it's different from many of the other um, snow RNAs and SCA RNAs in that it's an autonomous uh, pole 2 transcript and it's not intron encoded as most of the other ones are. And along with this, it has no polyadenylation uh, tail as far as it's known or signal, uh, and thus. It's also not clear how this transcript actually terminates. And I'd say that's true essentially to this day. But what was recognized early on, and what was a little bit of dogma in the field was that it actually had a precise end, as is true for other box HACA snow RNAs, that it always ended three nucleotides downstream of the uh, ACA uh, motif. And so this is where things stood for uh, quite a while. Um, one thing that's also true, as I alluded to before as well, is that there are multiple loss of function mutations in telomerase RNA component. And here we've illustrated it um, uh, taking some data from this uh, fantastic uh, cryo-EM structure from Evan Odalis and Kathy Collins, and also a re uh, registry that Julian Chen um, uh, maintains of uh, Turk mutations and other telomerase gene mutations. You can see here in all the, all the red nucleotides, be they in the template region or in the catalytic domain or in the HACA region over here, they all cause, uh, are associated with different telomere uh, diseases as well too. So there are many, many uh, loss of function mutations that uh, affect the function and accumulation of TERK in different ways. Um, but it's still not clear uh, how the levels of, at least at the, at the time, it was not clear how the levels of this RNA uh, were regulated, uh, given that it had to be so precise and it was affecting telomerase so much. And it's uh, not clear how the three prime end uh, of the uh, RNA component was defined. And from our standpoint, the answer for this came, uh, or at least the answers are coming from uh, studying patient mutations uh, again. So in 2015, uh, in the uh, in whole exome sequencing, uh, agnostic uh, genetic studies, essentially of cohorts of patients with dyskeratosis congenita, and then a separate study of families with pulmonary fibrosis, mutations were found in an exoribonuclease poly-A specific ribonuclease. Uh, these were almost simultaneous, and it was very strong genetic evidence that, the, that this gene must be involved uh, in some way in, these, in this disease uh, spectrum. And what's interesting about this is that at the time, for the most part, this gene was uh, most heavily implicated in our housekeeping function, which was the rate limiting turnover of mRNA by deadenylating uh, long poly-A tails and then uh, catalyzing then the turnover of mRNA. This is what thought to be its role, I think, based on studies in other uh, organisms uh, as well. But the genetic studies um, were clearly showing that this was associated in telomere biology in some uh, fashion. Uh, all of the other factors that were found to be in, uh, mutated in uh, DC and uh, pulmonary fibrosis have known roles in uh, telomere biology, and this gene uh, had, had none. And some of the uh, insights, I think, into how then telomerase RNA is processed and stabilized in our work ended up coming from uh, uh, deciphering this mechanism. So we had patients in our cohort and a registry also who found, uh, were found to have PARM mutations. And these mutations were loss of function as shown here. So pretty substantial uh, deficit in the protein level overall in the patient's primary cells. 
um, especially for a gene which had a purported housekeeping function. So we're talking about 90% or so loss of protein in, in these patient cells. These patients entirely phenocopy other patients with, um, with telomere disease. So there was no distinction clinically between them and other patients who have mutations in other telomere gene pathways. And because so many of the mutations affect TURC, and because in our cohort, we were trying to find out other mechanisms that, uh, that regulate TURC, and also essentially looking for non-coding mutations in known genes that would affect TURC, we had actually already measured the levels of telomerase RNA component in our unknown part of our cohort, including these patients. And what we knew about these patients was that they actually had compromised telomerase RNA component levels as well, somewhere in the 30 to 50% range by qPCR here, and by uh, Northern Blot here in the patients iPS uh, cells and in various clones of them. But it's, it was hard to understand then how this, um, uh, this gene, uh, poly A specific ribonuclease, would be affecting uh, TURC because TURC doesn't have a poly A tail. And also, if it was actually involved in, uh, in loss of function and its turnover, then that would be paradoxical. It should actually be uh, upregulated instead. But anyway, we started looking at the ends of the, uh, poly the telomerase RNA component. Uh, by RNA ligation mediated race. And I'd say that uh, this was also stimulated by a little, some burgeoning evidence in the literature that there may be other roles of poly A specific ribonuclease just at the same time in some snow and uh, RNAs, uh, whether they could be in their maturation or their, uh, their destruction. And so by looking at the um, uh, telomerase RNA component three prime ends by uh, RNA ligation mediated uh, race, uh, here is the pattern. This is just a this is just an, a PCR amplicon on an agarose gel inverted, and this basically shows what the end of the telomerase RNA component looks like uh, for this amplicon. Uh, and then, if in the patient cells, you could see very clearly that there was actually this extended form and rather discrete uh, band too. So that was one indication that there was something going on at this level. And then, if we actually knock down PARN by shRNA in regular cells, we see the increased. Uh, this increased uh, extended form as well. And if you look in the I IPS cells, you get the sense that there's a decrease in the overall quantity of the transcript, but also then you have this dichotomous form and this extended form of the, the transcript as well. And then when we looked at this by um, deep sequencing, uh, first, if you look in a normal IPS cell, what you see is indeed you have the, um, the canonical end, three nucleotides downstream of the ACDA box. Uh, and the majority of the forms of telomerase RNA component are, are ending at the correct location. Um, but there were several forms um, that actually extended beyond, uh, whether or not by one nucleotide, which would be one either uh, genomically encoded or post-transcriptionally added adenosine here, or at uh, other locations further downstream where the genomic sequence uh, would end. And then there were actually these adenylated forms that were being found at some frequency in these, um, in these cells. So this was actually a little bit different. There's a larger complement of, of forms that actually were not uh, ending at the canonical end. And that varies by cell type too. So IPS cells have a little bit more of an immature uh, form in general. But in the patient, what you saw, first of all, was that you actually had a decrease in the overall uh, number of um, uh, proportion of uh, species that were ending at, at the mature end. And this is in, in addition to the fact that the overall steady state level was reduced. So the uh, number of mature forms is, is further reduced. Uh, and also then there were further, ex uh, further accumulation of extended, genomically extended forms and then uh, adenylated forms as well of the telomerase RNA com component, both in this patient and then in another patient as well. And that explains that appearance on the uh, agarose gel. So these, these um, uh, RNA forms of telomerase RNA component were coming out extended and also uh, adenylated. And, and these actually translated into, the, into instability in the uh, RNA component as well. Um, if you do, we used actinolysin D on the IPS cells and we found that the half-life of the um, overall RNA um, component was uh, lower in the cells which actually had uh, PARN deficiency as well. So this suggested that those extended forms were actually unstable in the cells too. And in terms of whether we could pin the phenotype then of this telomere problem on, on telomerase RNA component or whether we'd have to invoke some other um, uh, factor that could be uh, dysregulated at the RNA level, what we were able to show is that when you knock down uh, PARN in uh, 293 cells that you get a shortening of uh, telomere length and it was, and TURC itself was sufficient to rescue the telomere length. So at least this aspect of the phenotype and the telomere shortening could be explain, explained by the compromised uh, TURC level as well. So for us, this basically um, formed a model where that 
uh, nascent telomerase RNA component comes out in genomically extended and then adenylated forms. And one of the important roles of PARN is to actually uh, foster the maturation of this form by re removing the adenosines and the genomic extensions. And that uh, ends up um, with TERC stability and then the ability to maintain telomere ends. And this is in competition with a degradation. Um, and we and others in the Parker, um, Bauman, uh, Bashand, and Kim Labs basically showed that there were other components of the uh, exosome, uh, RNA exosome that were uh, facilitating the degradation of these extended forms. And then in terms, uh, and when you had parent deficiency, this, this uh, axis, this end of the axis was uh, favored and you ended up with lower uh, RNA component levels. And that this uh, adenylation was being mediated by uh, one of the enzymes uh, of the TRAMP complex in yeast called PAPD5 as well. So we proposed that knocking down some of these uh, components might actually restore some of the balance in this uh, form. So if we actually inactivated PAPD5, perhaps in the setting of even PARN deficiency, you could restore uh, the balance maturation with importantly recognizing that none of the um, lesions are null. All of the lesions are hypomorphic in PARN and also in most of the other forms of dyskeratosis congenita because null uh, lesions usually result in um, a loss of, complete loss of function and lethality too. Um, so just to talk about PAPD5, because this is the uh, topic of uh, what we ended up targeting, um, PAPD5 is a non-canonical poly uh, polymerase. So canonical polymerases, as this audience of course knows, are those that actually facilitate the polyadenylation and, uh, of mRNAs. The non-canonical uh, polymerases, there are now at least 11 that have been identified in humans. These are now uh, under the category of terminal nucleotidal transferases because they have various substrate preferences. And for a lot of them, their functions are being discovered. Some are better understood like the tut dases. And in, in, in some ways now the, um, uh, what used to be called PAPD5 and 7, now 10.4a and 10.4b, but some of them, their functions are essentially not uh, described yet. With regard to uh, PAPD5, uh, it is the home log of TRF4P, which is the catalytic component of the TRAMP RNA quality uh, control pathway. Uh, in human cells, however, it is present in multiple complexes with distinct roles. And I will say that we started looking at this enzyme in particular because of this proposed uh, similar role in the quality control too, but this uh, uh, enzyme clearly plays different roles in, in humans uh, than entirely in yeast. Uh, it has been implicated in uh, mixed tailing and stability of mRNAs by the uh, by Nary Kim's group uh, by adding both A's and G's to mRNAs. And it's uh, most recently been shown to play a role in the production of certain viral mRNAs, which I'll get to a little bit by um, uh, the Muller, Muller et al, Irina et al, and also Nary Kim's group. So um, getting back to our strategy and some of the data that basically indicated that we could try to restore the balance of telomerase RNA processing, when we knocked down PAPD5 here, if we took um, patient iPS cells, which where we have this RNA processing defect and we knock down PAPD5, you can see that there's a partial restoration of the RNA component maturation. And that's reflected both um, on the agarose gel here and also in the deep sequencing analysis here too in both, in both patient uh, lines. And usually when we see something like this, it turns out that basically all of the rest follows both in terms of uh, RNA component stability and telomere lengthening. Well, here, we, here I'm just showing you from this uh, older published data, uh, the effects on telomere length in the iPS cells. So here's a PARN deficient iPS cell. In an, sorry, in this one in, in a normal iPS cell, knocking down PAPD5 doesn't have much of an effect on uh, telomere length. The uh, PARN deficient iPS cell maintains a lower telomere length, but when you knock down PAPD5 over the course of several passages and weeks, the telomere length increases. And just ignore this intensity, you really pay more attention just to the mean uh, telomere length. And the same was true for another patient who had a higher uh, telomere length, uh, but then that increased after knocking down PAPD5 as well. So this is with shRNA and shown another way, which is actually uh, makes a, a better point, I think in some ways is CRISPR deletion of uh, PAPD5. So if you take the PARN mutant patient cells, um, this is a, a Western blot for PAPD5. Um, and so the protein is uh, there in the, in the PARN patient and in the, in the wild type. And if we try to make clones by uh, CRISPR-Cas9, um, if we end up with no indel after we clone them out, then it has a similar amount of protein, but we can actually make clones that are null and clones that have truncations or lower levels of protein overall. And then we see an increase in the telomerase RNA component in those clones by the time they come out um, at the uh, steady state RNA level 
And by the time they come out also, we see graded effects on uh, telomere length. So the one that had no um, inactivation of PAPD5 looks to be the same and compromised as the PARN uh, original patient pool uh, compared to wild type. But by inactivating PAPD5 entirely, we get essentially back to wild type uh, telomere length and then the hypomorphic um, mutants are somewhere in between. So there's a graded effect, and this actually shows the effects of uh, a 50% loss, for instance, of PAPD5, and also importantly shows that complete lo uh, loss, at least in a, this human cellular context, of PAPD5 is tolerated and results in telomere elongation. So this led us to a hypothesis that PAPD5 could be a target for therapeutic inhibition in telomere diseases, um, and it led us to a high throughput screen for small molecule PAPD5 inhibitors. And this is the work that I'm gonna show you of Mehan Nagpal uh, in the lab that was uh, more recently uh, published. So uh, Neha executed a high throughput screen of recombinant PAPD5 um, with over 100,000 small molecules at the um, ICCB in Longwood, uh, an academic screening facility here using commercial compounds. Um, and then uh, through the high throughput screen identified hits that were triaged based on potency and specificity and then ultimately their activity in uh, other assays in vitro and then also in cell-based assays. And we'll show you here um, the um, uh, data on one of those molecules that was identified, which we call BCH-001. Um, so BCH-001 was capable of inhibiting uh, recombinant PAPD5 uh, very well and had specificity, which we were screen, counter screening against for canonical polymerases and then also non-canonical polymerases such as PPD4 and uh, s pombucid one And also uh, we could show that it bound in a dose dependent manner by differential scanning fluorimetry to recombinant uh, PAPD5. So both in an ATP dependent manner uh, and then also in a dose dependent manner uh, shown here. Um, and then uh, we took this molecule into our patient cell-based assays, trying to achieve the same thing that we had by PAPD5 knockdown. We'll show the three assays that we typically use to evaluate these molecules and prove uh, the concept here. So the first, again, is the race uh, experiment, the, the profile that, as I said, is pretty reliable uh, indicator of uh, processing and stability of telomerase RNA components. So here's the extended form in the patient cells and the uh, wild type cells have a, a mixture of the two uh, forms. And when we uh, expose the cells for several days to one micromolar BCH01, you can see in the pairwise comparisons of untreated or vehicle treated versus drug treated, um, uh, the processing of the telomerase RNA component is partially restored uh, in all cases, as you can see here. And it's a variable phenotype by clone and by patient, but you can see that there's an augmentation of the telomerase RNA component there. And then in terms of steady state levels, if you look at the northern uh, with the inhibition uh, with uh, BCH01, you see an increase in the uh, steady state level of the RNA component uh, across all the patients compared to the control or DMSO. And then uh, continued culture of the, of the cells for uh, weeks in pairwise comparisons versus um, a vehicle. You can see an increase of the telomere length by hundreds of thousands of nucleotides over the course of a week. Sorry about that. Um, in, in all of the patient clones that were uh, tested as well too. So this um, small molecule inhibitor is recapitulating the effects that we saw by targeted genetic inactivation of PAPD5 as well. Uh, one interesting experiment is shown here is the tolerance of uh, the cells over time to telomere, uh, to um, uh, PAPD5 inhibition, and then also what happens to telomere length over time as well. So if we basically uh, take the cells without any PAPD5 inhibitor and culture them, they have this short modal telomere length. Uh, but then quite rapidly, if you expose them to the, the uh, inhibitor over the course of weeks, they reach a higher length uh, close to that of wild type. And then they don't necessarily extend any further because of probably two reasons. One is that we're only shifting the balance of telomerase RNA component maturation and not able to exceed the physiological level of it. And there are also counter-regulatory mechanisms that, that regulate maximum telomere length in a given cell type that are still intact. So we are not causing excessive telomere elongation. And this effect is not a clonal selection because it is dependent on the, on the exposure to the small molecule. So if you split the culture at around week five and to keep some of them culturing in the small molecule and take it away from the others, the telomere length uh, slowly and gradually decreases. So you have conferred some replicative capacity on them because clearly the telomere length is longer than it started off, even in the absence. Uh, but that balance is now shifting to be telomerase deficient 
in this uh, in this setting as well too. What about other um, non-coding RNAs? And so in our prior studies and in others, uh, one of the other uh, SCA RNAs that was found to be differentially regulated uh, in the PARN mutant versus wild type or PARN inactivated versus wild type setting when you look genome-wide by RNA-seq was SCA RNA 13. So this is another SCA RNA and it's also a little bit unusual uh, in that it has two box HECA mot motifs, but it is an intron encoded uh, RNA. So it is different than uh, Polymerase RNA component, but it's the only one that would come up in our in our um, survey uh, transcriptome wide. Um, and interestingly enough, when we basically did a transcriptome wide analysis of inhibitor treated versus untreated PARN deficient cells, we found the same thing. The only commonly significantly differentially expressed RNA again was scRNA13. And what we can see when we take the same clones that indeed they do have a an abnormality in the processing of scRNA13 that is just very reminiscent of what we see with uh, Turk and that the effect of the small molecule in all these pairwise comparisons is the same thing to basically shift this balance towards the more mature form. And there's a significant effect on the steady state level. There's a deficiency of this uh, scar RNA uh, in the uh, absence of, um, uh, or in the deficiency of uh, PARN that is restored uh, when you actually add the small molecule as well. So this is true for a, a few other scar RNAs as well. Um, and but I think perhaps some of them don't come up because of the sensitivity of our uh, RNA-seq and transcriptome-wide uh, analyses. So, uh, but this is one of the most dramatic ones that uh, is affected, but then its deficiency is also reversed by the same uh, strategy. So cl uh, clearly it's being affected in the same, in a similar manner by this axis. So in terms of trying to translate this into um, uh, therapeutic, um, it's in, uh, you need a few things. The first thing that you need is a molecule that's better than a first primary hit tool compound. Uh, second, you need uh, a way of modeling this in vivo. And the problem with telomerase RNA, bio, telomerase and telomere biology is that it's not recapitulated very easily in, in rodents. So I'll show you some of the things that um, uh, came up that allowed us to basically show some of these effects uh, in vivo on human uh, stem cells, some of the uh, technologies. So one was uh, while we were doing this work, there were in, from a completely different line of research in pharma, uh, an interest in developing hepatitis B surface antigen um, inhibitors. So inhibitors of surface uh, hepatitis B surface antigen expression because hepatitis B surface antigen is continually expressed even in chronic hepatitis B and is thought to be immunomodulatory and important for the carriers, uh, the chronic carrier state of uh, hepatitis B. So this was, these were cell-based phenotypic screens looking for molecules that actually would suppress the expression of, of hepatitis B uh, in cultures. And molecules were found this way, and one in particular is a class called dihydroquinolizinones, called RG7834, um, that was very, very effective, and it was uh, developed through medicinal chemistry on the basis of that assay without knowing what the target was. And then by yeast-3 hybrid screening, uh, the same investigators at Roche were able to identify that this pulled down um, PAPD5 and 7. And so it wasn't any, there wasn't clear evidence at that point that those were the targets that were actually suppressing hepatitis B surface antigen. But in more recent data, it is actually clear that it's in a very, very interesting mechanism, the production of mature mRNA, essentially, uh, of um, hepatitis B uh, that encodes the surface antigen is dependent on a stem loop structure in a nascent uh, RNA that does not have a canonical uh, polyadenylation signal. Uh, that recruits is ECCHC14, and then what's called, so PPD5 and 7, so 10.4a and 10.4b, and those are then required to basically add a, uh, something that looks like a polyadenylation tail, uh, at least the initial uh, sequence of it, and that ends up stabilizing the mRNA that produces hepatitis B surface antigen. And that this process, by virtue of inhibiting uh, both PPD5 and 7, uh, by these, this small molecule, inhibits the accumulation of that RNA and destabilizes it. So that's a very interesting finding that came out in, uh, in parallel for that strategy. So we were interested, of course, in seeing uh, these molecules work in our uh, setting. And so we uh, synthesized RG7834 and several other dihydroquinolizinones. And to cut a long story short, much of which is in uh, Neha's paper, uh, I'll just show you the telomere length. So basically all of them were able to increase telomere length substantially in the PARN deficient state. And remembering that these are the ones that actually were optimized by medicinal uh, chemistry. It's not just any molecule of this class, but the ones that were most effective 
in inhibiting hepatitis B surface antigen were also very effective in, in restoring telomere length in these uh, patients also. Here are DMSO controls, which are short in all of the other molecules where the telomere length gets longer. So this was useful because these molecules that were better, they were more bioavailable and were more potent as well uh, for us to be able to do an in vivo test. The second, um, the, the, the second enabling uh, technology comes from collaboration with Scott Wolf and, uh, and Dan Bauer, where they were able to achieve very high efficiency um, they are able to achieve very, very high efficiency CRISPR-Cas9 mediated uh, gene inactivation in primary human hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells. And I'll show you uh, through this collaboration what was achieved uh, in our hands, which was basically the inactivation of the PARN gene in our primary uh, HSPCs at uh, over 95% uh, routinely. Uh, and so this is with a CRISPR uh, RNP strategy, and it actually was able to allow us to look for the phenotype. So here we inactivate several different genes. You should, and we're looking at the same TURK3 prime end processing. Here, when we inactivate TURK, of course, we've made the cell TURK deficient. But if we inactivate PARN, we are able to see that extended form uh, of the telomerase RNA component after five days of in vitro culture of these HSPCs. And if you co-deplete PAPD5, you do not see that extension. And then if you actually add the small molecules after doing the gene inactivation, you can see a better uh, an enriched uh, maturation in, with BCH01, but also a much better, almost completely restored uh, maturation with RG7834 too. And that corresponds then to um, steady state levels of polymerase RNA component in the same cells with this being a control a gene inactivation, control locus AVS1, uh, and no real effect of the small molecules, but when we inactivate PARN, we see a depletion of the uh, telomerase RNA component and then a restoration with the small molecule. So then with, uh, with Scott and Dan Bauer, um, we're able to take these um, HSPCs and uh, complement immunodeficient uh, mice uh, because again, the telomere biology in mice is not the same and see whether or not this strategy would work to actually uh, restore molecular phenotypes of uh, TERC deficiency in these, in these mice. So, took CD34 cells, did high um, efficiency CRISPR-Cas9 gene inactivation, injected them without conditioning into this uh, mouse strain NBSGW, which, uh, which will chimerize uh, human cells and xenotransplant, and we're able to feed them uh, DMSO uh, in their water versus uh, RG7834. And what we see after uh, six weeks, if we recover the hema human hematopoietic cells from the mice, that with an activation of AVS1, there's no uh, TURK3 prime end processing uh, defect. With PARN inactivation, you see the same uh, depletion and also uh, extended forms of, of telomerase RNA component, and that this is entirely reversed when you use um, RG7834 in the drinking water. And then what effect does it have on telomere length? So um, in, in the hematopoietic cells recovered from the bone marrow of mice, we could use FlowFish, that same assay I described to you that's used clinically, to uh, determine the mean telomere, tel telomere length in the uh, lineage of interest. And so uh, the thing that we're able to take advantage of uh, in part is that the human telomere length is much shorter than that of uh, inbred laboratory uh, animals. So we have a completely different range uh, in which the, the, the telomere end uh, peak is as shown here. And we can also use cell surface markers like CD45 as well. Um, and so what we can see here is that with the uh, PARN inactivation, you get a shortening of the telomere length over the course of uh, several weeks compared to the same cells which actually uh, have been targeted for AVS1. And with RG7834 in the drinking water, you get a, a partial restoration of the telomere length or, or less of a decline in the telomere length over time. And that's quantified over multiple animals over here on the right. This is the mean fluorescence intensity for the human cells that came out, human CD45 cells, um, that you have a significant increase in the telomere length as well too. Uh, so um, unfortunately this model didn't recapitulate uh, marrow failure over this uh, time course or like loss of the human hematopoietic cells, but at least we feel confident that we can see an impact on a disease relevant stem cell compartment using this uh, strategy. So uh, in summary, uh, what I've shown you is that um, from our end, patient mutations um, have revealed uh, non-canonical polymerase, PAPD5, as a target for manipulating telomerase uh, RNA component, and that um, telomerase RNA component maturation is dependent on the axis of two enzymes, PARN, for its maturation, and PAPD5 for its destabilization. Um, 
high throughput screen identifies specific small molecules of PAPD5, and those are able to restore telomerase RNA biogenesis and telomere length in human stem cells by oral administration in vivo. Uh, so the implications of this is that this is the first demonstration of small molecule modulation of uh, telomeres via telomerase RNA component instead of by manipulating TWIRT, uh, which addresses uh, some safety concerns importantly. And so this provides a potential systemic therapy that ends up effectively targeting stem cells by virtue of their own endogenous uh, telomerase reverse transcriptase um, uh, expression. And in the other cells where TWIRT may be upregulated, uh, it is unlikely that there would be any effect on telomeres in those uh, cells in the absence of TERT as well. So the physiological shutting off of uh, telomerase uh, happens naturally in those cells too. Uh, All right, so uh, with that, uh, I'd like to thank uh, again, uh, Frank and Jay and the RNA Collaborative and the Initiative for RNA Medicine for creating an amazing community here for us to present uh, our work uh, and for uh, synergizing some of our efforts. Uh, in the lab, uh, the work that I showed you on the small molecules and it's in vivo proof was in, entirely spearheaded by Neha Nagpal, a postdoc in the group. And I showed you the, uh, the work of uh, Diane Moon and Barish Boyraz in terms of the genetics and the mechanism of uh, RNA-PAPD5 and the other folks in the lab, both past and present. I'd like to thank the patients and families. So most of our work is done in basically proving the concepts using patient uh, samples. And we're of course driven by the idea of trying to uh, develop a therapy for them. And very key collaborators, Jik Fong and Jianning Wang at Brigham and Women's Hospital were instrumental in the biochemistry. Uh, Dan Bauer, Jing Zhang, uh, Scott Wolf, and Kevin Luke for the HSBC uh, manipulation and the xenotransplant uh, assays. That's been really transformative. Uh, Patrick Ahan, Emily Lowe, Albert Tai for uh, informatics, and Jennifer uh, Smith and uh, Gary Fry for uh, help with the screening too. And all of our, our funding sources, several of which are involved in trying to help us translate this to patient therapy. So with that, thank you all again, and um, I'll take questions. Uh, thank you very much, Sunit, that was fantastic. So I am, uh, I'm sorry to the people that arrived late if you were expecting Carmelo Nisero to give the next talk, but unfortunately he's fallen ill and he's not gonna be presenting. So we have some time left over now for Sunit to take questions. So feel free to unmute yourself if you'd like to ask a question in person or you could type it into the chat and I can ask the question. Uh, but maybe while we're waiting for people to, to, to think about their questions, I'll, I'll ask the first one that, that's come up in the chat. This is from TDS and I think he's, he's, he's asking something that's on a lot of people's minds. Um, does uh, the activity of these drugs on telomere length, like your RG334, um, does it increase the time to cell senescence or increase the lifetime of the mice? In other words, could this be the fountain of youth drug? <laughs> so that, so th thanks for that question. Uh, so that's that's uh, interesting. You know, way deep down inside, there is a desire for this to actually counteract some aging and probably all of us, not just in these rare diseases. But um, there's a couple of things. Um, so first, we can't test that in mice because as far as we can tell that this axis is not preserved in mice and uh, the telomere biology is very different in them. Um, in terms of what happens in normal human cells, we, get a hint that there may be a little bit of augmentation of telomerase RNA component level of telomere length, but not in, ever in a statistically significant enough sort of way. So I feel like we might be nudging that a little bit, but not in a very demonstrable way. The thing that is most clear is when you have a deficiency uh, caused by, you know, par mutation or discarin mutation to see that this is restored too. So maybe there could be a little bit of an effect, but um, not one that we are able to show very clearly in our model systems. All right, thank you. So there's a question from Kirsten and 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 then I'm gonna ask her to follow up. She asks whether, could somebody uh, turn the music off, maybe just mute themselves, thank you. <laughs> it's like the, uh, the finale. Um, can your RG7834 be used to treat patients with mutations other than PAP D5? Um, yeah, so why don't we start with that? And, and then she asked, what about scar RNA 13? Does, does that cause any potential side effects when it's upregulated? Right, so, so the first one, I think the, the point was PARN, right? For PARN mutations, can it be used to t uh, treat any other patients? So we've shown it, um, and others, actually another, there's another paper in the field basically showing that, uh, um, that PP5 inhibition can, can nudge 
telomerase RNA component into better levels when you have discarry mutations, which is not by the same mechanism. It acts in its biogenesis and its stabilization, um, uh, but it it isn't the type of thing that's counteracting very directly the, the processing uh, for the most part too. So, but we can see the effects in that uh, context as well. Um, the other um, genotypes that could affect uh, telomerase RNA processing and stability, we haven't checked them. Some of them are quite rare, so we don't have IPS cells from those patients, but we should try to do that uh, experimentally. Um, and the other, the other question, sorry. What is about SCAR RNA 13? So, so I mean, does, does its upregulation potentially cause side effects. And then I have, I have a corollary um, question, which is, you know, does this implicate SCAR RNA-13 in these diseases? Yeah, so great question. So, so it's been back and forth a lot about whether or not telomerase RNA component is sufficient for, to explain all of the, um, the, the manifestations. And, you know, and, and one of the arguments in, that favor, in favor of that is that most of these manifestations of the patients can be seen when you have Turk mutations themselves. So you don't necessarily need to invoke other RNAs, but there are other RNAs affected. And SCARNA13 is one that comes up both in discarry mutations and now in partner mutations over and over again. So I think that the answer is yes, there's gonna be other SCARNAs SCAR and SNOW RNAs and perhaps other non-coding RNAs affected by these mutations. How much they translate into physiological manifestation of disease, I think is hard to know. Um, so, and then along the lines of what happens with the the augmentation of SCARNA13. Well, in the PARN deficient state, there's a deficiency in it. And so when we, when SCARNA13 goes up, it goes back up to the wild type level. So I don't think that necessarily, once again, here, there's a, there's a super physiological augmentation in a normal cell. I think it's basically just restoring it to the regular level as shown by that North plot. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Frank, I think your, your music. Uh, sorry, uh, Sean, go ahead. Yeah, uh, Sunit, how are you? Um, <laughs> so uh, I, two kind of quick questions. One, um, in the context of uh, some of these, uh, like TC or, or some of these, um, I guess, bone marrow failure that might be associated with telomere shortening, things like this. Um, do you see, I mean, maybe there is some evidence or suggestion that there is some sensitivity to cancer development, things like this in, in some of these diseases. Yeah. Are any of these genes kind of targeted? Do you see kind of mutation in cancer as a way to kind of restore telomere length and, and function in this context? Right. I think what you're asking, are there somatic mutations in the telomere, in the genes that are mutated in DC patients? Yeah, like, like the, the, the PARN or the, the PAPT5, for example. You mean, and you mean in, right, in people who don't have germline mutations? In people, well, in, in DC patients that might develop cancer, do you get, ah. are, you know, is that a mechanism to overcome that, yeah. that kind of telomere deficiency? It's a great question. You know, the thing is that the amount of material available to study from the cancers, frankly, like, I don't know of a single good study of actually studying the cancers and their molecular genetics. And, but, but you would think, you know, that a PARN mutation could actually potentially comp compensate and be something that allows outgrowth. Um, if you were asking the other question about whether or not these things are mutated in cancers, we cannot find it. I don't think I've seen anything with PAPT5 mutated more than other, um, uh, genes and cancer. And, and the other question that I have is just in, in terms of the, the model um, that you're using, the seeds like four positive cells and putting them back into the mice and, and, and kind of looking at knockdown of power and things like that. Um, do you have a sense of how, 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 how many divisions your cells are going through before you're really starting to see deficiencies in your telomeres in, in that context? Or is that, is that something that is um, like how quickly are they are those telomeres, how, how quickly is that attrition happening? I think. Yeah, no, it's a great question. Now, a lot of the stuff that we're able to assess on, on the way out, we can, you know, about a million cells are put in, CD34 cells, and a lot of what populates those mice is B cells, interestingly enough. Uh, and so we actually, that we find it easier, easiest to, um, to assess those. And if we're looking at CD45 cells as, as total, it's a majority of B cells too. So I don't know how much, how many cell divisions it has taken for them to get to that and what that is homeostatically over time uh, as well. But are you are able to see that kind of, uh, once you you see that attrition and then you go in with your um, with uh, these small molecules and you're rescuing kind of uh, uh, after that or? No, no, it's the other way around. Basically they're getting the small molecule essentially at the same time as the transplant. So this is oh, okay. basically preventing, so the, the graph that you saw would be a prevention of the attrition, not a rescue of the attrition. That's an interesting experiment that we have. Thank you. There's a question from Jaquito Zephyr. Uh, 
He asks, any ideas about the binding sites of these inhibitors to P a PD-5, given that they're very specific? Or, you know, I, I would ask an earlier question, I mean, how specific are they? Do they inhibit the other, uh, um, you know, ZCH genes? Right, so these, these uh, the small molecules that we're studying uh, seem to be hitting the active site um, by virtue of just making truncation mutants. Uh, and the ones that come out of the hepatitis B screen have to be non-specific enough to inhibit both PAPD5 and 7. That is known from genetics that you have to inactivate both of those genes to actually end up with the level of suppression of hepatitis B surface antigen uh, that they're getting too. So there's some there's something that's, you know, that's that's basically selected for essentially in those assays. We have not been selecting for that in our assays. And we don't know the full range of specificity amongst the relevant um, family members because it's a matter of basically trying to generate them one by one like and find their recombinant forms and we just haven't gotten to all of them too but we are interested in that we, we were able to make pabd4 for instance and uh you know we can test uh, sid4 but uh, we have to make the other ones great thanks any other questions from the audience you can type it into the chat or unmute yourself All right. Well, if there are no other questions, let's thank uh, our speaker again one more time. Thank you, Dr. Agarwal. It was fantastic. And thanks to all of you for attending. I guess we will be back in a few weeks with the next RNA Collaborative. And um, yeah, happy RNA hunting for everybody. And we'll see you all soon. Stay safe. Thanks very much. Bye. Thank you.